Hello, welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. I'm Claudia Bester, I'm the Director of Public Programs here and I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's discussion about paternal instinct. Tonight's conversation is part of the Building the House Within speaker series sponsored by the Sims Man Institute. Now on to tonight's Hammer Conversation. Everybody knows, anecdotally, that committed and involved fa fathers have a tremendous positive effect on children's health and well-being. But what about the positive effects on the fathers themselves? The maternal bond, maternal instinct, they're very well known and well documented phenomena and images of motherhood abound in pop culture, but less well known is the neurobiological impact of raising children on the fathers themselves. So here to discuss the subject of fatherhood are two noted experts in the field, Dr. Ruth Feldman and Dr. Kyle Pruitt. They both conduct research and examine the neurobiological aspects of fatherhood as well as the individual and collective impact of paternal involvement. Dr. Ruth Feldman is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Bar Ilan University in Israel with a joint appointment at Yale University Medical School in the Child Study Center. She's also the director of a community-based clinic for early childhood disorders and heads a medical intern program in early childhood clinical psychology. Her research focuses on the biological basis of social affiliation, parent-infant relationship, biobehavioral processes of emotional regulation, the development of infants and young children at high risk stemming from biological, maternal, and contextual risk conditions, and on the effects of touch intervention for premature infants. Her research on the role of oxytocin in health and psychopathology has been instrumental to understanding the biological basis of social collaboration in humans. Dr. Kyle Pruitt is a clinical professor of child psychiatry and nursing at the Yale School of Medicine's Child Study Center, where he also served as the director of medical studies and where he recently received both the Lifetime Distinguished Teaching Award and a Lifetime Achievement Award. He's also been in the private practice of infant, child, and family psychiatry since 1974. As past president of Zero to Three, the National Center for Infants, Toddlers, and Their Families, Pruitt headed America's most prestigious multidisciplinary research and training center for infant family professionals. Dr. Pruitt has published over 100 scientific articles and books such as Nurturing Father, Father Need, Me, Myself, and I, The Child's Sense of Self, and Partnership Parenting, How Men and Women Parent dif Differently, Why It Helps Your Kids, and Can Strengthen Your Marriage. He also sits on the PBS National Advisory Board and the Sesame Street Workshop Board of Directors. Along with his wife, Dr. Marsha Klein Pruitt, he served as co-investigator of the Collaborative Divorce Project to reduce the, project, the trauma of divorce in young children's lives. And also, they've collaborated on the study Supporting Fatherhood Involvement for, the, for California's Office of Child Abuse. And he's helped establish the prestigious International Early Childhood Peace Consortium at the United Nations. So now, I'm pleased to welcome to the stage my collaborator in this series of talks about contemporary issues in early childhood development, the Building the House Within speaker series sponsored by the Sims Mann Institute. Dr. Victoria Mann Sims is the president of the Sims Mann's Family Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Victoria Sims. I'm Vicki Sims, and welcome. We're really happy that uh, we have two amazing speakers. Uh, for our first speaker series. Uh, the institute that we have started, the Sims Man Educational Initiative, is focused on the development of children and families ages zero to three and focusing on 21st century parenting and the differences and changes in that. And this is my colleague, Carol Karp, who is going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing at the Hammer and why. Um, I have so enjoyed working with various parts of this project. The Sims Man Educational Initiative for Building the House Within has used building the house as a metaphor for the house that we continue to construct within ourselves for a lifetime. Art has the capacity to positively impact one's personal experience. The depth of one's learning is enhanced through the examination and integration of culture and, society, and history. To advance this mission, the Institute creates programs that explore art in all forms, and through this exploration, encourage individuals to reflect on their own history and culture. 
We would like to introduce now Dr. Kyle Pruitt and Dr. Ruth Feldman. I think you're going to enjoy hearing what they have to say. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. Ruth and I have known each other a number of years. We've never had a chance to sit down together the way we are going to be doing tonight. And we want to thank uh, the Hammer and the Sims Man Foundation for the opportunity to be here. It has given us a chance to actually finish a conversation for the first time in many years. <clears throat> we are going to be talking together tonight about something that is um, terribly important to both of us, um, both professionally and personally. We have a lot of passion for this topic. We haven't always been able to share it. We don't even live in the same continent, much less the same town. But the ideas are so strong that um, I, I don't think we need all that much contact to feel that we're engaged in something um, that has the chance to improve the world. And I don't say that with hubris. I, I say that with conviction. First thing I want to say is the concept of the paternal instinct is, for me, um, a little narrow. I prefer to talk about the nurturing instincts that are within all of us. And they find different expression. Uh, depending a little bit on our gender, a little bit on who we are, a little bit on who we are partnered with, and a little bit on who we have as children. And so we're going to be talking about some of the drive to care for the needs of another, uh, particularly as we've begun to understand it from the paternal side. But that got us both thinking about why do we care about this? And I asked Ruth if she would be willing to start um, answering, and I will also answer the question myself of why did we get engaged in this pursuit? Um, why does it matter to us? And why are we still at it uh, all these years later? Right. So uh, a few minutes ago, Kyle asked me this question of why are you so passionate about fathers? And that got me thinking about why am I so passionate about fathers? So could you go first? Because I only had 10 minutes to think about this question, and then I'll, I'll go later. <laughs> I have an answer. But <laughs> of course. And that, too, is part of the collaborative nature of uh, conversation. I, um, <clears throat> I guess it started, actually, with my own father. I am the middle of three boys, and my uh, father was born in 1915 at a time when men were supposed to be supporters of their women, uh, repair the roof, and um, let the mother raise the children. But my father was not happy with that passive role. He took great delight in his boys. He had the huge support of my mother in that delight. And I know for sure that she didn't always agree with everything he did with us, particularly taking us all over the country uh, when there weren't a lot of men who even knew how to change diapers, much less keep a kid safe um, watching a rodeo um, at the Arapaho reservations. <clears throat> but we had a wonderful time, and he showed me a world that has... Um, uh, that has had his print on it forever. That began to feel familiar to me after I started working on um, the mother-child relationship. As a pediatrician, I got really interested in the experience that children have with their first caregivers. And, um, but that was a pretty crowded field. And I also noticed something myself, that my mentors, the people that I was learning so much about, had practically nothing to say about the role of fathers in the lives of babies. They wouldn't even talk to them when they came to the appointments. They left them in the waiting room. And I noticed the babies, however, had a slightly different attitude. The babies th thrived in their father's hands and in their arms, in their play, in their conversation, in their nonverbal conversation, particularly since men don't talk. But the babies got a lot out of those men. 
and it got I got interested in what the effect was going to be on the baby of that relationship and on the effect on the father. During that time, I also became a father. And that completely knocked my world into a cocked hat in the best possible way. And so I've been looking for answers about what felt so powerful to me personally ever since then. And I've been advised not to do this by my mentors who found don't bother studying paternal effects because all you're going to do when you look at babies who are being raised primarily by their fathers is you're going to find maternal deprivation. So Kyle, so stay away from that. I ignored that advice. I'm very glad I did. And now I'm the wrinkles that I have been able <laughs> to follow in the field have been a great joy to me and I think led me to friendships with Ruth and other people who are um, um, also taking a look at a relationship that is as long as any other relationship but is understood rather poorly for reasons that I'm not always proud of. But that's my answer, Ruth. I'm ready for yours now. Okay. So... Uh I started like Cal. I started with motherhood because it seemed to me the most important thing that if we want to understand human nature and our emotional life, mothers are key. And I also myself became a mother at a very young age. And I have a large family. I have five children. And as I was raising my children and as I was following these children uh, longitudinally from birth and on, they're now in their late teens, early 20s, all our cohorts, and you'll see some pictures of them, um, I realized that fathers are extremely important. And when Kyle was asking me this question, I started thinking about my father and a specific event that has been told in my family all the time. My father is a pretty famous rabbi and a Jewish philosopher, uh, a great thinker. And um, in rabbinical families, a daughter is not supposed to study. You're supposed to teach your Torah, your Talmud, your teaching to your sons. And a year and a half after I was born, there was a son. And a year and a half after him, there was another son. So at eight days, I was a verbal child. At one and a half, I already spoke. Uh, there was this party for the circumcision of my brother, and my father had all the all his mentors, all his rabbi. And the story goes, I don't remember it, that I was on his lap, and I was talking, and his big rabbi saw a very smart daughter. And he said, oh, too bad it's a daughter, because she's not going to grow up to become a sage. She's not going to become a learned woman. And my father, who was 25 at the time, he said, no, this is my smart daughter. And she will grow up, and she will be a very smart woman. So, and, and then from then on, he has studied with me much more so than with the boys who were not really interested. And I studied with him, and he, he went against his surrounding. And it was like a courageous act of studying with a daughter, uh, believing, and, and really charting for me an intellectual life, uh, which was not really common in his, in his surrounding. So the effect of fathers are, are in my personal life. And as I uh, followed our children uh, in research, I became interested on the unique effects of father, not children who had maternal deprivation, but what is unique that fathers give to children, even when these children have very nice and synchronous and attuned mothers. What is the unique thing that fathers bring to the table? And I've been studying these things ever since because Evolution gives mother a lot of primers. We have pregnancy, we have birth, we have lactation, we have this role of mothers. And at the biological level, there's a lot of preparedness to the parental role that evolution gives mother. And the question is, are there other or alternative pathways that father can have? And what are those pathways? And I think this connects to what you said before. If we if we come to understand what are the alternative pathways to just giving birth to a baby, to the instincts, the parental instinct, the paternal instincts, we can have some clue at nurturance, at this ancient practice of alloparenting, 
at our abilities as human to just care, committedly care for another one. And what, are, what is the biological basis for that? So I've been studying Father more and more, and I'll show you some of, of, of that tonight. And our latest study is about gay fathers who are raising uh, infants with no mothers in sight. So what happens to the father's brain when there is not a mother right next to him? The brain becomes similar to the maternal brain. The hormones become similar. What happens to the paternal instincts when they are not complemented by a mother? And this has been a very interesting story to me because there are alternative pathways to develop the maternal instincts. And So, Ruth, before you start taking us through that, I, I wanted to... Um, ask you to do a little thinking on your own. Why are you here tonight? What brought you to this particular conversation? Uh, we'll have an opportunity for questions later, but my own hunch is that you will, as you listen to Ruth's and my discussion, you're gonna go through several layers of the answer to that question about why you're here. And we're hoping that you will leave the conversation this evening um, disabused of some of the myths that you walked in with on one hand, some appreciation for the enormous plasticity of human relationships, and particularly some new appreciation for how important it is to get this started well um, in the first 36 months of life. It's not the only focus we're gonna have, but it is a predisposition that we both share in some of the work we're gonna be talking about. And one, I think one more thing we have to say, we've spoken about it before, a word of empathy. I think fathers currently are under a lot of pressure because women and society expect fathers to be involved. Fathers expect and want themselves to be involved, but they don't have any role model. They don't have a certain internalized. We all have had mothers, so we know basically what mothering is. And f I think a lot of fathers are really don't really know what they're supposed to. They want to be involved fathers, but and their own fathers have not been involved. And there's like a changing climate in society, and they don't really know. And sometimes mothers welcome the fathers, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they want them, and sometimes the message is mixed. <laughs> so I think fathers are at a, at a difficult point, and, the, and I hope the main thing that we will, you'll be able to come out from this conversation is that Fathers can do it, and they can do it well. And the one of when Ruth was going through some of the predispositions, the biological and the social predispositions towards supporting mothers in their job, one of the things that she implied, but I, I want to make sure we're clear about, the social supports that are present for most mothers across many cultures have a lot to do with how important women are as women when they become mothers. In fact, in many societies, the only important thing they will ever be permitted to do and valued for is procreating. Social support for fathering not much. Um, and many of the men who are working hard to do this now uh, are doing it with not a single active image of having been fathered themselves. And uh, so we're going to talk about why that's not doom. <laughs> it's a, there are many opportunities uh, between the father and the child to build these structures and to build these relationships, which can really turn around a child's experience as well as the father's. Okay, so maybe we should start on the journey from the first month of life. This is an image of father-child relationship. Okay, and I chose to entitle these these few slides as fathering matters, but matters not. And you know what? We would like to walk you through uh, the the last pieces of research is not why fathering matters in general. Well, it's nice to have a good father, but what are the specifics in which fathers, fathering matters? What are the specific contributions that father make to children's social development, 
children's capacity to become members of the society, uh, to have social reciprocity with their age mates, to uh, understand other mind, or to uh, develop the capacity for, in, uh, for empathy. So what is the unique contribution of fathering longitudinal to children development? So let's start with a few images of father, child, fa father, infant, father, toddler relationship. So what you see here is fathers and young children in a very loving, committed, caring, nurturing relationship. But what you see is fathers taking their children through the world. Fathers introducing the world to their children. Fathers exploring, co-exploring the world with their children at the beach, at the forest. You could see father and infant, even when the father in the middle is holding the child, they're both looking outside, looking towards the world. Compare this with images of motherhood. Quite different position. They are in a face-to-face, -face, close bodily position, and they're looking at each other. It's like they're learning how to examine the human face and respond to micro-level micro level shifts in social cues through mother-infant relationship. And this is not only in human mothers, but also we have a whole history of mammalian mothering. We have much less of a history of mammalian fathering. So there are different roles of mother and father. Mothers and fathers can be just as attuned to their children, just as synchronous. And we take these interactions and we take them apart and we look at every second, every split second of the interactions. Father can be just as synchronous and matching and carefully attuned to their kids. But while mothers and children take the face-to-face -face position and they synchronize their gaze and their affect and their facial expression, fathers and children look outside. Even as adult, you know, we two women go to a coffee shop and we talk to each other. Fathers and son, they go to the ball game and they synchronize while they're screaming together when there is a goal. So there's a different kind of um, what pre social preparedness that you learn with fathers and mothers? Well, r r the pictures of the fathers, you'll see <clears throat> the father often, when men pick up their babies, um, the, they are much less likely to do this, to hold the baby up against the crook of the neck, and much more likely to do this, to tuck the baby up, up to the side. And in fact, you ask, you take videotapes of fathers doing this, and nine times out of ten, compared to the mother, the mother will do it exactly the same way over and over again. And what is predictable about the father's management of the baby's body is that it is unpredictable. Fathers seem to like to have their children activated when they're in their care. And they also often prefer to hold their babies face out. And if you and no one's telling them to do this. This seems to be um, sort of a predisposition. I had a father once sort of said, "Well, this is my, you know, this is my my child is sort of my hood ornament." Right. Uh, so this, yeah. this is so like the rough and tumble play. It is the rough and tumble fight play. fight each other, or the father's throw in the air. Exactly. Often to the horror of the mother-in-law. Right. Um, <laughs> but if you watch the babies, you know, the babies are often enjoying this, and they're often quite intrigued by the difference. The mothers are, I once had this described by the sort of the mother, the mother hold is you're the, you're the captain in an icebreaker, and you're inside you know, your wheelhouse, and you and the baby are just going to be fine no matter what the world brings to you. The father says, we're out here together. We're going to see what comes. And so the fathers will often tell you, I'm getting my child ready for the world. Right. And the mother will often say, I want to make sure my child is safe in the world, and right. I want to control right. the, um, the interface, the boundary between my child and the world, because I know what's good for this child. That's my job. So the mothers wow. really, to, to continue what you just said, mothers really provide the rhythm of safety. And fathers provide this high arousal novelty. 
but they both come within the boundary of caring, right. attuned parenting. So here's just an example of what it looks like an interaction, the contour of interaction with father and mother in infancy. So when you look at mother-infant interaction, they cycle in a somewhat rhythmic way between middle arousal and low arousal, some laugh and some smile, and then it goes smoothly and there's high peak of high arousal and it's framed by social gaze so that mother is telling child well now we're going to have this laugh or now we are going to have this high arousal but the counter of father infant interaction is quite different and it goes very quickly very very quickly and unpredictably as Kyle said and the high peaks come at random so what we think is that at health, what is also important is that they match the biological rhythm. So these are more the female rhythms that we see them at the day old, and these are more the male rhythm. So at health, a child should experience both the rhythm of safety and the unpredictability of novelty, but also both a rhythm that matches their own biological rhythm and something that's a little bit needs adjustment. So a child should experience both in order to, do, to develop. So Dr. Feldman, which one of these is right and which one is wrong? Why right and wrong? Both and both, good and good, right and right. <laughs> A rabbi's daughter, answer a question <laughs> with a question. Yes. <clears throat> Weave them together and you get a safety net. A safety net. But an interesting yes. one. You're never going to get right. bored. Right, exactly. It's just like right. think about the 12 bar blues so that there is, you know, your left hand is playing that 12 bar blues again and again and again. And it's predictable. And every time we come to these families and we see them from the time they're a few months old, we now see them, we're now seeing these first families when they're 21. So basically the mother-child interaction, you know, has the same pattern. And then there's the father is the right hand and they can improvise. And I think this this balance that fathers can improvise given mothers are are providing the safety net. And mothers can provide the safety net because they are fathers who will take the child to explore the woods. I know we'll talk about this a little bit later, but we're both automatically assuming that um, our audience agrees with us that it's the impact on the child that matters here, not whether it's a happy father or a happy mother or whether they even agree. Um, but you may all not be on that same page with us because an awful lot of men and women find their parenting experience highly stressful, very confusing. Um, it's rare that you do anything that makes you feel the combination of incredibly Im significant uh, job this is about which I know absolutely next to nothing about what I'm supposed to be doing. And so when you look at a variation like this in interactive styles, if a couple is under any kind of pressure at all, it's easy to sort of hear them having a conversation, well, you have to do it more like me mm -hmm. because it's upsetting the baby, or why don't you do it exactly the way I do because I'm doing it the right way. Right. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how that works its way into the real life of many of uh, the families who are trying to raise children these days. But we're, yes, I will we'll confess right now, we're more interested in the outcomes on the children than they are whether the couple really is thoroughly happy with the arrangement because ultimately it is the outcomes on the children that I think have kept both of us interested in this field. Right. And I also think that stress and guilt and fear and confusion is part of any parenting. I certainly felt it throughout my parenting and still feel it. And any person, and all my patients and all my all the people I've so I've seen hundreds and maybe thousands of them, and I'm sure you've seen mm -hmm. as many, maybe even more, uh, in research or in clinical setting have had confusion. I think the question is not whether you do or don't feel confusion. We all do, but do we have those moments of elation? Do we have those moments of bliss and synchrony and right. the experience that this that we're doing something that is 
that matters the most, that it's the, the most profoundly exciting and meaningful thing that we've ever done. And that comes along the confusion. I think if you don't have those m moments, you are on the road to high-risk parenting, that parenting is just stressful and it's just overburdening. I think the emphasis on, on doing it right has overtaken the emphasis on the delight. I'm worried about that for American parents, that there's a right way to do this. The, the professionalization of parenting, let's get the right toys, forget the play, let's get to work right now, all has to be decided by the what kindergarten they're going to go to. And sadly, um, when we look at what our research tells us, it's the importance of these day-to-day -day interactions, the sensitivity of care, the importance of imagination, play, time together. Those are the things that set the foundation for good brain growth, not flashcards. Right. And so, interestingly, moms and dads interact around that in a very intriguing way which we'll talk about later. Right, and you think, I think it was in the 70s that Papasheks, Hans and Martal Papasheks, right. they coined the term intuitive parenting. And they were speaking about how basically, if we don't do anything, if we just um, take care of an infant with, with the intention of, of taking care of an infant, intuitive parenting comes, kicks in. We will do the right thing without looking on the internet, without reading a lot of book, because we have it imprinted in us. And there have been too many things deterring us from intuitive parenting. Um, and I think the need to do it right is certainly one of them, or the need for my child to succeed in a, in a path that I uh, designed for him, uh, not really listening to what the child needs, um, and not enjoying your your role as a parent. Uh, but intuitive parenting is there if we just let it be. Continue. So should we continue sure. to the biology? Uh, here I brought you two examples, and I wanted to bring two from two different cultures just so, so that you see that fathering, this physical high arousal fathering is across culture. So in my, con in my country, there are two cultures, the Israeli cultures, the Palestinian culture. So there's two examples, one of a father from Tel Aviv and the other uh, a father from Ramallah. And you'll see that they act exactly the same. I'm sure a father from Los Angeles would do something pretty similar. So just look at this kind of a father-like, father father-typical father -typical interaction. So mm. now you will imagine an Israeli father with a four-month-old child, and he's saying, hi, hi, tell me what to do you did today in kindergarten. And then he starts throwing the kid in the air. This is this father. And then you see a father from Ramallah, the daughter, she's three and a half years old, and she's already coming to the father, expecting a father-like interaction. It's very highly aroused. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> so this is highly enjoyable for the kid. So this is a study we undertook about 18 years ago. These children are now 18. We're seeing them again now at 18. We saw them when they were four months. We saw them when they were three years. We saw them interacting with their mother interacting with their father, interacting with both mother and father together. And then we started looking at their social development. So when they were three years, we went to the kindergartens and we watched them for about two hours and we wanted to see how these little kids for the first time, it's not kindergarten, uh, Kyle told me before that, it's preschool. By us, there's the same name for all of it. It's preschool. They're three to four years old. Okay, so it's the first time they go to a preschool and they have, tr they have peers and they have to manage co uh, conflict with their peers. Both kids want the color. Both kids want the slide. 
how does the child resolve conflict with their peers? Because we believe that parenting lays the foundation for your social development. So we wanted to see how it goes in relation to how the child, what kind of interaction the child had. And we measured each conflict with a child, let's, with another child, if they resolve it aggressively, if they resolve it dialogically. Well, you can take the slide first and then I'll go later, that's a, you know, a dialogical solution, or whether they turn to the kindergarten and just give up conflict. They can't stand for themselves. So there are three types of conflict. And then when the children were early adolescent, they were 13 years, we came again. We saw them interacting with their mother, interacting with their father, no, no longer playing on the floor, but in a dialogue that we set for them. And then we asked the parents and the children to invite the child's best friend. So it's an intimate relationship. The child has an intimate relationship with them. And we wanted to see how early relationship with the mother and the father would predict how they can be in intimate relationship. Now we, we are seeing them with their girlfriend or the boyfriend, the romantic relationship. But, but at 13, most kids don't have a romantic partner yet. So we wanted to see friendships. And what, they, and what we asked them to do was two things. One is to negotiate a conflict in their relationship when they're 13. And the other is to um, invent or develop some program to introduce in the school, some, something they want to do together for their school, <coughs> some, some kind of a positive. So there's a positive interaction, planning something together, and there is a conflict interaction. So what we saw is that children who had fathers who were highly sensitive and attuned and reciprocal at both infancy and in preschool Tended, to, uh, tended less to use aggressive solution to conflicts. So fathering, but this effect was stronger on the boys. You see, there's not that much effect on the girls. This is something we know for a long time, that sensitive, synchronous, and reciprocal fathering is especially important for the management of aggression in young boys. And we see it in America, there's so many children without fathers and there's a clear correlation between father absence and conduct disorder, high aggression um, uh, in, in boys, much more so than in girls. So here we saw that boys who had fathers who were more attuned tended to resolve conflicts with their first peers in kindergarten less aggressively. When they were 13, children who had fathers who were throughout their childhood more sensitive, more reciprocal, more synchronous, tended to do better both in the conflict and in the positive. But when you use all kinds of statistical methods and you leverage the mother contribution versus the co father contribution, the father contribution was more than the maternal contribution to conflict. Mothers more to the positive. So that means that fathers are really critical to teach you how to manage conflict in the real world with other, how to manage conflict, stand on your own, but also be respectful, not how to dialogue dispute, how to not shy from them and not to dialogue them in an aggressive way. So the ability to negotiate conflict stems from father son reciprocity throughout life. So here is where fathering matters. Fathers can teach us how to negotiate conflict, disputes, disagreement in a more dialogical way. So I have a question, Ruth. Yes. How do you think, what are the mechanics of that? Is that just done by role modeling, watching the father deal with uh, the neighbors, watching the father deal with his partner watching the dad deal with his business associates or is it direct teaching don't do this because it's bad for you or don't do this with your friends or keep your hands to yourself what do you think it is i think it certainly has an element of modeling that you learn by watching but also remember the father child interaction the father child interaction is stronger is more highly aroused, is more unpredictable. Children learn, practice with their father. I don't think the don't do it would do it. 
I think it's reciprocal fathering. It's not fathering that's putting a lot of limit or very harsh. Children who have had harsh fathering do not know how to negotiate conflict dialogically. It's father-child father interaction that maintain high arousal and unpredictability, but also does it in a very synchronous and attuned way. And this is what you practice during father-child, rough and tumble play. Well, that's interesting about the, the, Leb the, the Lebanese father-daughter couple. You kept saying, now wait, here it comes, here it comes, like you were preparing us for the fact. Right. Just as the father was preparing the daughter, the daughter, here it comes, here it comes, and I know it's coming, and it's exciting. And I was wondering how the mothers in the audience saw that interaction, whether that's the kind of interaction that drives you crazy about what your husband does, leave her alone, you're driving her crazy, or is it the kind of thing that says, you know, I can't do that, she goes completely out of control, but you, you get away with it, I love it when you do that. Or I remember my dad would, did, with, did that with me and I liked it. Or I remember my dad did that with me and I hated it. You all have reactions to that. And they're important to understand. And I'm not telling you whether they're good or bad. But the key that Ruth is trying to put you know, very clearly in front of us is it's the history of the interaction between the father and the child over those years where they have this, we'll manage this together. I'll show you where too far is. I will tease you. I will support you. I will frustrate you a little bit more than your mother does. I'm not going to run in and help you instantaneously because they're not going to be cutting the crust off your toast when you go to UCLA. You're going to have to figure out how to do that on your own. Get those shoes tied. Handle yourself when you're in a situation where uh, you've got to get to the bathroom and you don't want to wet your pants. How are you going to do that? So here is a story, a very funny story we had today at lunch. I ate lunch with uh, Vicky and Ron Sims. So we were talking about uh, uh, what kind of guest do you go to the refrigerator and take your own food or you don't. And Ron said, well... If you're not going to go to the refrigerator and take your Diet Coke, you're going to stay hungry and thirsty. So you better go up. And, and we got to talk about how mothers, they would say, well, what do you want? Let me bring it to you. Don't worry. You'll have it. And the father would put limit and say, suffer the consequences. If you don't want, here there's a refrigerator. It's open. You can have it. And if you don't do it, you won't have it. And I think that part is what leading us, just like you said before, to learn how to fend for ourselves and how to go into the world. Remember the first images, fathers teach us how to go into the world and how to do it courageously, if we had good fathers, how to do it courageously right. and how to do it socially, how to do it without aggression. I think this finds its way into some of the different trends in the way we discipline our children. And that you'll, when mothers um, are, when they're, when they're unhappy with their children, um, I, t I teach this concept with some of my students by telling this story. This happened to me a number of years ago. I'm in the checkout line behind um, a mother with about a 23, 24 month old. It's 5.30 on a Friday afternoon. We're all trying to get home, feed our families. And this, this, um, this toddler is in that final checkout place where all the chocolate is, where they put all the candy bars right there near the cashier. And, and she's just taking them out one at a time, putting them in the basket. And the mother says, put those back. Sally, we're not having those for dinner. I've got to get home. Put them back. And, of course, the toddler ignores her completely and to the complete delight of everyone else, just kind of continues to taunt the mother. Mother finally gives up, checks out, and I actually, my car was sort of close to her, so I kind of followed her, not on purpose, but I, I knew this wasn't over. And she said to her daughter, after she thought she was out of earshot, I am not bringing you with me again. I cannot stand it when you humiliate me like that in front of all those people. Mm. You're not only not going to get chocolate again, but you, you're, I'm not even sure you're going to get dinner. Mm. And it was clear that she, 
there was an emotional there was an emotional cost to her misbehavior, right. which means you and I, sister, are not as close as we were when you listened to me. There was right. an emotional cost to your misbehavior. You're not as close to me. I'm not feeling as close to you. Father, similar circumstance. Put that back. You know, they send people to jail for that around here. And there's no point following him to the car because he's not going to say anything else about it. He's said his piece. And the kid listens. And the kid often listens. And you're going to see this sort of the father getting you ready for the real world, the mother getting you ready for relationships, the intimate cost of of disobeying. And mm. they're both incredibly important lessons. Right. And when they're woven together, you get data like this that says children are going to keep their hands to themselves. They're going to use less violent problem solving. That's going to help them be more popular, more successful in school. All kinds of good things come out of this. And this is what's so interesting if you don't follow the literature. There, this is such important data from Ruth because it shows to us we think this gets off to a good start, but how long does it last? It lasts when it really matters. In adolescence, when impulse control is the key issue about getting yourself regulated. And so if you're off on a good start, guess where you're going to wind up? An awful lot of doors are going to open for the children who have positive conflict resolution skills. And a lot of doors are going to close on the children who don't. I think one more thing, uh, this is very true, but I think one more thing we have to consider here is that up until, let's say, 20 or 30 years ago, there was this clear division between mother is the nurturant and father is the disciplinarian. Think about, I, I went to look at the origin, the etymology of the word father in English, and it comes from the word pater, and basically it means in old English, a man who has given birth to a child. Basically, you contributed your sperm to this child, something very distant, very cold. Uh, and, and, the, and the concept of father is used in our culture, okay, like the founding fathers, or to, to represent law, to represent order, to represent the rules, okay, to represent something that is not compromising, the set the, the, set the ground. And I think what is the complexity of, of fathering nowadays is that it's no longer the father is just the dis disciplinarian and the mother is just the nice and nurturing figure, is that they both have to do both, just like mothers are going to work and they have to manage the work family conflicts. Father take upon themselves more the nurturing role. So there is still much more of a discipline to a father and much more of a nurturing to a mother, but each one has to integrate both into. And it's not like Freudian thinking that mothers are critical for the first three years, come the Oedipus complex, and that's when fathers begin to be important. It's only when children are beginning to have a sense of morality that they learn from their fathers, and it's important to have father-child relationships. No, we believe that fathering should start at birth. And this is, I think, what's going on now, that fathers need to integrate that disciplinarian role, but not in a distant way, in a more hands-on, day-to-day way to discipline the child. Um, Stephanie Kuntz's work on marriage, the history of marriage, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, Ruth, but she makes a very similar point where men and women are about equally upset now uh, at the tensions between work and family. Very different than it was even 20 years ago, right. where mothers were much more upset about work-family tension. Fathers, working men, are now just as upset about work-family tension as their spouses are, and that men and women actually are closer than they have ever been in their dissatisfactions between their dreams of family and work and what is actually happening. Right. And so I think that's a remarkable layer of common cause. And instead of uh, our slinging you know, tomatoes at each other about doing this wrong, we ought to be working together uh, much more closely 
about the work family distortions, about supporting. And, yeah. and I hear from many grandparents, by the way, many grandparents, how engaged the men are, either their sons or their sons-in-law. And they're surprised to see it. And they that. are surprised right. and thrilled. Right. Thrilled to right. see it. So we need the support of the elders and the grandparents to say, this is a good this thing. A good keep thing. up. Keep this up. And we ought to be looking at work and family leave. Support these young families when their children are young. Because when you get a good start, your kids are right. on a very different path. Right. Sorry, I slipped into a sermon no, there, but right. that this is, is exactly what I think we need to be putting these pieces together in right. this way. But and we us, need and yeah. we need to know that this is okay. This is like if we, you know, go all the way to Lacanian thoughts, the name of the father, the father as giving the stamp that this is right. Maybe that's the role of grandfathers or mm. researchers or people of authority to tell young father that this is right. It's okay. It's the right way to be involved. And it's the right way to be emotional. And it's the right way to do it from birth. We so also need to tell the mothers that what the dad is doing is, is a thing of significance right. and of value. Right. And she may not be hearing that from her mother. Right. Um, she may be hearing something quite different, mm -hmm. but we're we're going to be talking about the importance of well of positively engaged dads, and the one thing that predicts whether a father will be positively engaged in the lives of his children is not his experience with his dad. It's not how much money he brings home. It's whether his partner thinks that this is a really good idea right. for their family, and her support matters more than you would ever imagine. Right. So they used to th talk about gatekeeping moms, that mothers have instinct to keep fathers at bay. And it's very, very interesting because at, at a deep biological level, we see it in research. We have this study that we take first-time parents, very nice young couple, six to eight months, or four to eight months old infants. And we connect them to a lot of machines that register their autonomic, the skin conductance, like eight channels of autonomic function to see their anxiety. Anxiety, and they connected, and then they take turn in interacting with the child. But we ask them to interact with the child in a special way. They first play with the child, and then they still face. We ask them to still face for two minutes in order to stress the child. So they play with the child like a nonverbal communication. And, and still face means your face you, muscles suddenly go paralyzed. Right. You can't respond to the child, and it's yeah. stressful for the parent, and it's stressful for the child, and then you do it for two minutes, and then three minutes. It's a very well-known paradigm in right. developmental research. So you play, and then you still face, and then you play again, okay? Now, mother and father are there, and we measure their autonomic stress. Now, when mother does still face to the baby, fathers, are okay, no rise in their heart rate, no rise in their perspiration, no, but just look at what happens to mother. They don't behave, they maintain good posture, mm. but their biology screams, what are you doing to my kid? So when the father still faces the child, the mother really gets very, very nervous, all signs of stress in her body. That means that at the very, very ancient level of our brainstem, of our physiology, we don't really trust that father. Or our trust of that father needs some modification. So I think... The only way to work on it is through understanding what Carl has just said before, that it's essential for that child to be having a good relationship with the father, which includes some stress, that the child's relationship with the father and mothers need to learn how to back off, really dampen this physiology that screams, what are you doing to my kid? And let the child interact with the, with the, with the child, let the father interact with the child, but also stress the child. So let's go a little bit to the biology, and this is the system. <laughs> oh, this is great. This is oxytocin, the love hormone, the bonding hormone. 
So just a few words about the biology. I'm not going to tire you too much with it. It's a hormone that you see it's produced in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, it's a deep structure, a very central structure. It's part of our limbic system in the middle of the brain. It's not part of the cortex. And from the hypothalamus, it's through the posterior pituitary. It's released into the blood. And then part of it goes into the brain. Now, what I put on the right side is that you should see that oxytocin is a very integrative system. It crosstalk with many other systems. The two important systems that you see in the brain is the amygdala, the stress system, and the reward system, the dopamine reward system. So oxytocin is anxiolytic. Its production reduces amygdala response. You will be less anxious. Close relationship help us combat stress, our stress reduction. We should fight and manage stress through our attachment. Children learn to manage and regulate stress in the context of their early attachment. This is how the brain learns to manage stress. And dopamine is, you know, is a big discussion because sometimes the dopamine reward system, a lot of time children go to drugs of abuse. The Dopamine system hijacks the oxytocin system. So what we want to see is to in integrate our reward into attachment, that the greatest reward we should have is from close social relationship. And when the two systems are too much separate, so we don't know how to drive reward from relationship, we go to drugs of abuse. Now, one of the first thing we looked at parents at the transition to parenthood, and this was a very, very, very surprising finding to us. We got about 160 mothers and fathers, their first time child, all very good committed parents. And most, 87% of our mothers were nursing. And oxytocin was always known as the maternal instinct, the maternal hormone. It's related to birth. It's related to lactation. What could be more maternal than that? And we measured repeatedly mother's oxytocin and father's oxytocin. And lo and behold, they both increased from before the time they got pregnant, but they were at the same level. And they were at the same level when the kid was one month and the same level at three months, and at six months, and in one and a half years, and at three years. This is what we got so far. And this was very surprising, because oxytocin increases through birth and lactation. And that got us to think that evolution left for father other alternative pathways. And since then, there were studies showing that, for instance, adoptive parents, mothers and fathers, also have higher level of oxytocin after they spend a few months in contact with the infant. So oxytocin is like a reactive system. It supports the formation of affiliative and social bond, but it doesn't only need pregnancy and birth and nursing. It can be there through active caregiving. And then we went to the animal literature, and for the 3% of mammals that have fa father care, you see in their brain the same thing. Mammalian fathers who take active care of their young, there are structural changes in their brain contingent upon the amount of caregiving. So it's not the pathway, it's not the limbic pathway that are primed by pregnancy and labor. It's a different kind of pathway, but it comes with caregiving. So paternal caregiving is key, because fathers, distant fathers are not going to have it. We actually try to do it with, we, we, uh, we call them the high-tech dads that see their kids from weekend to weekend. But the $100 we paid for their participation in our study wasn't sufficient for them to leave their work, so we were never able to get <laughs> a group of high-tech dead. But I bet you their oxytocin is not as high as the committed dead. Because you need you skin need to skin? Not skin to skin. You need right. active caregiving. You don't need skin to skin. You need to be committed, and you need to provide care. 
and the provision of care and the play and the commitment and responsibility for child care, this is going to alter your brain. This is go going to alter your hormonal system. This is a pathway for fathers to bond with their infants, even though they don't have the other primers. I was just teasing Ruth a little bit by saying skin to skin because when some of the early data about this came out, that was one of the early hypotheses was that the uh, that was what was stimulating the oxytocin. But Ruth really helped us understand, no, it's the much more complex dynamic between the caretaking, not just the physically doing it, but also the emotional commitment to it, how it changes your memory, how you look forward to it. You know, there's this thing that drives an awful lot of mothers nuts, which is that they're when the babies cry in the middle of the night um, and the, the father gets up occasionally and the babies seem to settle a little quicker than when the mother gets up. And um, the we neonatologists have known for a very long time that um, babies um, alert to higher pitched voices when um, uh, they're trying to get somebody's attention. But once they're upset, they often calm more reliably to a lower pitched voice. So there are all kinds of physiologic dynamic relationships that are going on between the father and the baby. And I think we are just beginning to sort of take a peek uh, behind the curtain of the complexity having, because these are not, you know, just to be clear, the oxytocin is high in these men and they're not breastfeeding, okay? They're changing diapers, they're supporting the mother, they're looking forward to their time with their infants. They are looking forward to knowing what they're doing, which is a hard thing for men. Don't, they don't look forward to doing things they don't know how to do. But the baby and experience are what gives them the competence to have these interactive systems growing and getting stronger. And that's why uh, going again back to the support of his partner in uh, being with time alone with the baby, figuring it out is what will give him the confidence that I know what I'm doing and my baby is safe with me and can convince the whole family. But this is part of the physiology of right. that process. Right. I, th mm. I think this is absolutely right. I want to say a word about evolution. And uh, the story about evolution, so far, we have not seen too many changes throughout evolution from one species to the next. We've seen, we, we've seen some changes. I think the father's story here is we're seeing evolution as it's happening because we, we are seeing changes to the father's brain that come with what they say, environmental pressures or evolutionary pressures. Social changes make father do things they're not used to doing. And in 20 years time, 30 years time, we see changes in the brain. And I think this is very exciting time. Perhaps this is the answer, another answer to Kyle's first question, why are you doing this? I think that the father's brain is one of the most exciting things that we can see from an evolutionary perspective because very, very, very little is changing over a long time. And here we see that within one generation, there is such a tremendous change to not only father's behavior, but father's brain. And I think this is a very, very exciting length to see human nature and the social brain and how the social brain is, is defined and changed and altered by environmental conditions, by social norms, by cultural practices. So I think this is like a really truly biobehavioral story, how biology affects behavior, behavior affects biology, and together they really mold the human social brain. Before we get to some of your questions, which we should, you should start thinking about. Uh, just will you show us those pictures about the brain? Absolutely, yes. right. 
So this is a study of about 100 parents. They are all at the transition to parenting because we wanted to see it. The first time you become a parent, your brain, in all mammals, but in human as well, your, parent, your brain undergoes the most changes. It's the change from non-parent to parent. So, so this there is, is a parent brain. There is a parent brain. Yes. And it, 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 it changes with your first child. It undergoes modification with every birth, but it's the strongest. So there are about 100 parents, and they come in three groups. There are mothers who are primary caregivers. There are fathers who are secondary caregivers but committed. And then there is a group which is the first time in history we have its homosexual fathers raising infants without any mothers, but within the context of a partnered relationship. Because raising children within a committed relationship is very different than single parenting. Now think about it throughout human history and in every cultural context, women typically take care of children. And a lot of time they do it Several women, extended family, mother, grandmother, aunts, etc. Okay, so here we have the first time in history that we have two fathers raising infants without mothers. So, what does that primary caregiving role and absence of mother does to the father's brain? So, the first thing I want to show here is that we found that the parental brain, when we image that with fMRI, we see two network. One network that is more inside the brain, brain a limbic, non-conscious brain. It's called a core affect network. It's a kind of network that we have automatically, we and any other mammals, and it registers it's like an emotional barometer. It registers in the environment, like I could see quickly if you're attentive to me, if there is any threat coming, if someone is smiling at me. This is like, and it, it's ongoing. This is the core affect network. The second system, and this is important for parenting because parents have to immediately detect if the infant is in distress. They have to also detect reward cues from the infants, but it's critical for infant survival that the parent automatically detects, and the amygdala is a very, very important node of this core effect network. Okay, so you see the amygdala, you see the uh, ventral tegmental area, which is the center of the dopamine, and we see the insula, the anterior cingulate cortex, and the hypothalamus. So all these load onto an unconscious deep brain structure that register online automatic, where is my infant at this very moment? It's critical for survival. And then it's complemented in human by a mentalization network structure that are in your cortex along the midline, but also here above your ears, the superior temporal sulcus, the medial prefrontal cortex. It's a mentalizing network. It's implicated in social understanding. This is a system that's responsible for theory of mind ability, our ability for empathy. So parents need that. They need to project what the infant needs, and they need to plan parenting, and they need to learn patterns of infant, represent cognitively what the infant. So there is an interplay between a deep, automatic mammalian brain, okay, and a more cortical, more human, more empathic brain, and they interact. Now, if I ask you a question, I'm sure you'll be able to tell the answer. What mothers have higher and what fathers have higher. Mothers have higher activation of the limbic just like mammalian mothering. Mammal human mothering has been pretty uniform throughout evolution and across cultures. Mothers respond very, very strongly to their infant signals, to their infant face, to their infant cues, to their infant smell. Fathering, much higher um, activation of the mentalizing network. Now the question is what happens? Okay, father and mother lay together. Okay, the infant cries. Mother wake up right away. She says, oh, you know, you go, you go pick up the kid. Okay, the father goes, picks up the kid, diapers the child, bring him back. Now, what I think has happened, and all my friends have told me so, is that mothers sleep with their amygdala open, 
and fathers sleep with their amygdala closed. If the mother wakes them up, they'll be willing to feed the kid and diaper the kid. They'll do a lot of things. And then they come back to sleep. Okay? Now, once you have a mother, believe me, I have a 23-year-old child now in India. I sleep with my amygdala mm-hmm. open. Once you became a mother, mm-hmm. your amygdala is open for life. My husband sleeps very well. Now, every morning he gets up and he writes, Dear Tamari, how are you? What you do? But his amygdala is closed. Now, what happens? I think this is the complementary role that you spoke about before. Fathers can close their amygdala because mothers sleep right next to them with the amygdala open. Now, what happened to those fathers who don't have a mother? There are two men. They're raising their infant. The infant survival depends on them. And there is no mother to maintain an amygdala open all the time. The interesting thing we saw is that in these gay fathers, primary caregiving fathers, they had both system activated. They had high amygdala activation, just like mothers, and high mentalization activation, just like father, and there was a functional overlap between the two. So when they activated the mentalizing network, which is the father pathway to the paternal brain, together they recruited the choraphic uh, network, the limbic network, the amygdala network. So they had high activation of both. And this is really, really interesting because you see an integration of the two systems when fathers raise infant without mothers, but we see plasticity of the paternal brain. And what we think is that this father instinct, fathers having actually as high amygdala as mother, as mothers, and amygdala is sensitized by pregnancy. But it tells us that father in- instinct could be just as strong as mothers. They just come about by different ways. They come about by a person assuming a primary caregiving role to that infant and engaging in day-by-day active caregiving. So the fathers actually have it harder. They have to work hard. They have to take care of the infant. But if they do it, they can activate their amygdala to the same extent as the mothers. When I first heard about this data, um, Ruth, I was I, I was just blown away because what it tells us is it says that the the needs of the infant have an active biological component that will affect the biology, the neurobiology, and the brain architecture of this very old guy. Yeah, amazing. It is amazing. We we didn't when I was in medical school, we didn't we thought this would never happen. The the brain could not be that plastic. It also left me with a question about what is unique about about gay men parenting couples. There are no unintended pregnancies in that group. Right. They really go to big trouble. It is fully intentional. It's really and so it is a prepared central nervous system. I am ready for this. I will succeed. The odds are maybe against me, but I am going to succeed. If we were able to understand more about the physiology of intentionality, I wonder what we could do for all those couples that wind up with children who didn't plan to. Mm. And so I'm, I'm so glad you're sticking with this work because yeah, I think that's a new door that I'm, I'm hoping we'll be able to get through. Um, do you have another one, another slide? And then I we'll stop for questions, I think. Oh, this is a nice one. Yeah. This is a really nice one. It's, thanks for asking. One of the questions we asked is, this, is, this is a question that really relates to the biology of the evolution of the human families. How do families come together throughout evolution? What, how does the mother and father brain works together to raise a child? And it's not just through conversation. There's got to be some brain-to-brain coupling. Because when you are handling a small, a small infant or a small child, you need to do things so quickly. So you got to communicate with your partner very quickly 
without words, what's the next thing to do to the child? How to perceive, how to understand the signal of this non-verbal non infant and how to plan the adequate response. So we took mothers and fathers couples, okay, not, not, this is not a gay, this is a different sample, and we put them in the magnet and we showed them the same video of their infant. Okay, so they are seeing the same infant, and we measure their brain over time. It's a three-minute video. There are a lot of points we measure. And we asked in what brain area they synchronize over time. So their kid is looking, there's a synchrony. Their kid is crying, there's a synchrony. The kid is smiling, there is a synchrony. What we saw is that system I described before, the mentalizing network the system that enables us to read intentionality, the system that enables us to understand other people's mind, other people's behavior, other people's social cues without them saying it. So those parts of the brain, okay, that are responsible for social understanding, mothers and fathers synchronize them in real time when they are together caring for a baby, and then they can together plan adequate parenting. So many times what, parent, what happens because of this brain-to-brain -brain synchrony or brain-to-brain -brain coupling is that they both see it. Mother thinks, well, you know, this kid's got to be diapered. And the father, without a word, goes to diaper the baby. Or the father would think, well, this kid needs to eat. This cry means that eating is due. And the mother will go and feed the kid. And this mechanism of brain-to-brain -brain coupling, which is critical in human attachment, it happens between parent and child, this is how we shape the child's brain. This is how the brain of an infant is Comes into the uh, comes into the social world. I think it reminds me of a very very beautiful phrase that I read. I think as a teenager, from a book by D. H. Lawrence. It's called The Rainbow, and it described a mother and father with a large family. I think the second generation of the rainbow, and they moving to a new place with a bunch of kids, and everybody's very stressed. And it, it, the end of that paragraph, I don't even remember the words, and it says that mother and father smiled to each other and the rainbow opened between them and within this rainbow, the kids were able to feel safe. And I think the rainbow that opens between mother and father, particularly when there are life stresses, is the, rain, the rainbow of brain-to-brain -brain coupling between the mother's brain and the father's brain into that brain-to-brain -brain synchrony, kids can synchronize and feel that they are part of that first social group that's called the family. This gives them the ability to be part of their community, part of the social world. So I, I want to close by sort of saying you have just heard the, um, <laughs> the, the, the hymn to the post-attachment world. You've just heard Ruth say it is the relationship between the couple. And by the way, her research, and they all, these are all biological parents in this study. Right, right. Yeah. And you would be the first to say it may not be the biology. It may be the relationships. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's important for us to all understand. It's the co-parenting connection that really is what gets metastasized by our children as their parenting experience, not just one versus the other. Um, so we've had a chance to have our conversation. Time to get some questions from the audience. Oh, hi. hi. Um, I had a question regarding um, the amygdala. Um, and you made that connection between the maternal and the paternal, um, how it was open and closed. Um, it was more likely to be open with the mom, and then it was closed with the dad. Um, I had a question regarding if you correlated that with positive and negative reinforcement, because I understand that fathers tend to employ more negative reinforcement onto their, to their progeny versus that to that of their mothers. So, do you have data that can actually correlate between those those two types of connections I just made? Mm -hmm. What would what would you like? How would you operationalize positive and negative reinforcement? Like something like 
you're doing great or don't do that, something in that, that matter? Yeah, yeah, right. I, would, I would. Is this on? It's on. <laughs> um, I would actually, um, well, I don't know what kind of data you took. I mean, did you, right. it was it observational or was it? No, with the brain, Yeah. Uh, uh, they, we filmed uh, a parent-infant interaction in the home environment and they watched the infant themselves with a, with the infant, and we compared it or we contrasted it with a stranger parent and infant. So when you examine the contrast between their own interaction and someone else interacting with the child, this is where you see the attachment system coming up. This is how you know this is the technique in brain research to examine here we also took a more stringent criteria we also compared it to the self as if extracting from the parent infant interaction both a picture of the self in the same living room doing something stupid like reading a book mm -hmm. and another parent infant interaction so we take those brain area that respond to self mm -hmm. and those brain area that respond to Ownness, my own interaction. So, back to your question, we, we didn't correlate it with positive and negative reinforcement, but we found that parents who have higher activation in the core affect network, in fact, were more sensitive and synchronous with their children. But more interestingly, we saw these children when they were three years old and they had to manage positive and negative situation. And the more activation, the, the more activation of this core affect network, the better the child was regulated. So if the parent's brain was more responsive at a limbic lower level to the child's cue, the child was better able to self-regulate three years later. So this parental brain response matter, just like Kyle said before, it matters for child development. It's not just something that the parent have. It's transmitted to the child. We have a, a, a seven-year-old, so it's a little bit outside the age group. But in our, in our modeling of what's important, like Victoria and I, we really have a, a, a good sense of co-parenting. When you see your child's behavior outside of your modeling, so you don't see them acting as your tribe. Let's say an example would be that you value honesty, and then you see uh, disingenuous behavior in your child. And I, as a, as a father, look at that and think, well, there should be a consequence, whereas I think by representing you right, it's more of a sense of betrayal that Victoria would show, uh, is that there's an emotional response where mine is, hey, look, you can't do that. Uh, something has to show you not to do that again. When you don't see behavior in children that, that reflects the core values or modeling that you want to see there, is there an optimal response that parents should have to be trying to put them back on track, to get them back in the lane, that uh, when, when you both want the same thing, but of course you approach it from maybe a different gender perspective? You, uh, when you said you both want the same thing, my hunch is that is not a perfectly concentric circle, that it's overlapping circles of what you want in terms of you what you hope your boy will be presenting to the outside world and that you may have agreement that you want a reliable truth-telling child that honors relationships in which the truth matters you're going to go about it in a somewhat different way because you think you have you have a slightly different obligation to him and it fits with some of the things we were talking earlier about core belief getting ready for the world. If he lies to people, he's not going to have any friends. Core belief, if he lies to people, that means you might lie to me, and there's a trust issue between you and me, brother. We're going to have to settle that. They're both correct, and it is the overlap between those two approaches that will carry him into the outside world where he's going to meet a 100 variations of those core values but he'll remember, this is what my dad, this is the way my dad sees it, this is the way my mom sees it, and I'm sort of half of each one of them, and I'm gonna have to figure out how to do this. A little white lie, maybe sometimes it's okay, maybe never, 
uh, a big lie that hurts somebody else. That's really out of the question. On the other hand, if I get away with it, maybe. And so you can see how he's set up. You're setting him up so that when he's you're not around, which will be for most of his life, he will have internalized from you these are the consequences of departing from this path. And he's watching you in the truth-telling you're doing, how you handle the caller at dinner <laughs> asking for money, how you handle the little white lies that emerge in your own life. He's watching those too, cataloging those. He's only seven. He'll start pointing them out to you when he's 13. <laughs> And will never finish. Yes, that's right. <laughs> if you're lucky. If you're lucky. Thank you. You talked about <clears throat> gay male parents, but you didn't talk, if, unless I missed it, about single parents and how that plays out in terms of the two, of the two systems and the two approaches. And I would say my practice is almost all female single parents. Right. A K, but very rare male. Do you, have you done any work on that? Or I, any have thoughts on it? I have not done work, empirical work on single mothers, so I can't tell you about the brain or the hormones. My hunch is it, it is so difficult to raise a child with two parents, and it's nearly impossible to raise a child. Uh, I see many mothers in clinic single mothers in clinic, and I would bet that their stress hormones and stress physiology and stress-related brain circuits would be much, much higher, so that the, the balance between the stress and the pleasure would tilt much more towards the stress when you're a single mother. But I don't have any data on that, That's so right, I, mean, I, I that, right? That's certainly right. my impression It's just as well, prediction, but. yes. The, um, I have been involved in a different kind of research than Ruth. It's not in the laboratory, it's in the community. And we were involved in looking at uh, ways to intervene with um, migrant worker families to reduce the incidence of neglect and abuse um, in the Central Valley in California. Uh, this was done in your state, and you can be very proud of it because it was really a, a game-changing piece of research where we looked at uh, the positive engagement of fathers early in the lives of their children, and it turns out that you can reduce rates of neglect in that population to practically zero if you support the fathers to be positively involved, and you use the supports in the community to do that. 20% of the people in this study were not married, and they, but they all had partners. They weren't living with them always, but they partnered with somebody in their family or in their community to raise the child. And so the single parent who feels the support of someone to whom they are emotionally committed, and that can be a member of their family, it can be a dear friend, it can be someone that they trust to help them raise their child. Those kinds of partnerships can be extraordinarily supportive, even outside of a, uh, a husband-wife relationship. Because when you're exhausted, you have a little help. And that is a really critical issue for single parents. It's the respite question. And whether they have someone that they can co-parent with that may not be married to, uh, they may not even be blood-related to them, but they see them as a source of support and friendship. And if you're gonna do anything to support the single mother or the single father family, it's to tell them to take those relationships seriously. And sometimes you even ask them to come into your practice. You wanna meet them because they're so important to the well-being of that woman or the job she's trying to do. So I think our support as a community of those relationships is a big support for these exhausted and often depleted women. Can I ask one more question? You looked at uh, male homosexual parents. Did you look at lesbian parents at all? 
No, I didn't because I thought that the interesting question from an evolutionary perspective is the gay parents. Uh, two women raising children we've seen throughout human evolution all the time, in fact, most children throughout history were raised by several women. So I didn't think they needed brain adaptation. The interesting question is what happened when there are no mothers? So this is what uh, okay. I was looking for. In my own clinical experience, and I have worked with uh, 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 dozens and dozens of lesbian parenting pairs, is that you will often see some of these same dimorphisms, the good cop, bad cop, the frustrating, the harder discipline, the softer. You'll watch those kinds of dimorphisms uh, occur naturally. And the women will often, often describe themselves as, I, I'm more maternal, she's more paternal. And our children go to her for these kinds of problems and her for this kind of problem. and. Uh, she lets them get away with murder. I make them toe the line. I'm getting them ready for school. She's getting them ready for their first love affair. You'll hear those dimorphisms going back and forth. So I think some of the issues that are supposedly related to sex chromosomes may be as related to culture and role as they are to some of those other predisposing factors. Thank you so much. And I was just curious about this idea of co-parenting. Um, that, in, and I guess to, to your point, just so I'm clear, so a father can be doing the dishes and helping out, and that's like co-parenting because this that gives the wife some support and needed rest. Is that like sort of a fair sort of assessment? <laughs> I'm, I'm not well, a professional. The data, man. I'm just trying to figure this out. I notice you're here by yourself. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> the 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 the. The survey data tells us that most men would consider that co-parenting. Most women would not. Okay? And I'm going to get into even more trouble if I go any further than that. No, but I, I want to say something about co-parenting. Co-parenting is a critical uh, construct nowadays because it helps uh, couples who are divorced and what we want to stress to divorced couple is that there is a co-parental relationship between them. Once they brought a child into the world, they are always co-parenting. And that the co-parent, sometimes the co-parenting and the marital relationship is the same role, and sometimes they're not. They may be in marital relationship to other partners, but they're always co-parenting this child. And the definition of co-parenting, or at least how I use it in clinic, is that the solidarity in the, between the two parents with the goal of raising this child to the best of their ability, how they join forces, how they coordinate, the, the, coordinate their, uh, the, their work together as parents in the parental role. And I think now co-parenting is such a critical thing to teach parents is that they don't have to be married, they don't have to love each other, they don't have to be partner, but they do have to be co-parents. So what are the components of this co-parental role? And it's in the best interest of the child. And um, it is the fervent wish of every child that they be co-parented. And if you ask them what they hope will happen in their family, it's their mom and dad will love each other. And even if they're divorced or not living together, it is the wish that they will work together on their behalf. Co-parenting, when you Google it, up until a couple of years ago, always meant after divorce. Um, when Marsha and I wrote the book on, on uh, um, on parenthood and on co-parenting. We didn't realize at the time we were writing, but it's actually a divorce prevention book because it's about taking you and your relationship with your spouse through the developmental needs of your child. And there are periods in life that are easier to co-parent than others. You know what the Armageddon of co-parenting is? Toddlerhood. I know it's a little bit surprising. But what are toddler, what's toddlerhood about? Individuation. Me, myself. It's all about me, the toddler. And that brings up certain issues for the father, brings up certain issues for the mother. It's not adolescence, it's toddlerhood. And if you do your homework, the work of Jamie McHale has been very helpful in this, 
If parents are supported to talk together about what they want for their children, not just the color of the nursery or when to buy him his first tablet, but instead, what are we going to do about discipline? What about co-sleeping? What about your mother? What about my mother? What do we believe? What do, what do we want to have happen? If you do that homework, actually toddlerhood goes better for you because you know where your partner stands and you're not guessing. And the toddler will raise holy hell with anybody who's not communicating with each other. You don't have to be on the same page, but you do need to be on the same book. So, okay, like, I know a lot of people who take care of a dog like you would, like a child, like they, they swear it's their baby, right? So do you think that you would see the same change in someone's brain with the oxy, oxytocin uh, production? Like, would you think that would be comparable if they took care of this dog or whatever pet like their child? Because a lot of people do have pets who they, right. who they nurture just like that. Well, nobody checked the brain response to a pet, so there, there are no answer. But a, a human-dog relationship has been conceptualized as attachment and all the kind of changes that, uh, that are related to attachment are there to some extent. But I don't think anyone checked oxytocin levels. Who would pay for that research? And, uh, <laughs> Imes or somebody? I'm sure somebody paid right. for it. Yeah. But I think in a situation where there is dependency, for instance, blind people with their dog, I, I would say there's a higher chance that there is some kind of synchrony of neuroendocrine response to someone who is, besides being your pet or your attachment target, there's also a life dependency on that, just like an infant with a parent. So that may tick some of those hormonal systems. Okay. I, do we need to call time? Do we need to call time? Thank you very much Thank for you your questions. Much. And your Thank you very much. Thank you, Kyla. I learned a lot. <laughs>